Hi everyone, I'm Sunil Reggae, consultant psychiatrist. Welcome to another bite-sized video on an interesting psychiatric case that I encountered a while ago. So this is the case of an 18-year-old female who was repeatedly presenting to hospitals with repeated vomiting episodes. And she was referred, they obviously carried out a lot of investigations and no organic or medical cause was identified. So she was then referred to psychiatry for anxiety, evaluation of anxiety. Now, what's important, of course, is whenever we are going through, even the, when they're referred to psychiatry, it's very important that we go through a structured evaluation. Uh, this is something where I've covered the diagnostic hierarchy and the thinking as to how we rule out different conditions. So even though a medical cause has been ruled out through uh, physical examination uh, in the emergency department or through a physician, it is still important to go through it because sometimes more heads are better than just one evaluation, for example, because things can be easily missed. So in this case, we start off, of course, with again going through the organic eval evaluation and checking what has been ruled out. So in this case, abnormalities of the GI tract, any neurological abnormalities, head injury, for example, acute infections, motion sickness, um, any medications such as chemotherapy or uh, migraine headaches uh, were ruled out. There was no evidence of migraine medications. Uh, antibiotics, I mentioned chemotherapy, morphine, uh, other aspects were also ruled out. So uh, just briefly, uh, this is sort of the diagnostic hierarchy, as you can see. Um, we think about the organic side uh, carefully. And then the next layer down, as you can see, is the substance use section or the medication aspect. So it's really just a prompt. Now in this um, 18 year old female, we of course ruled out the organic section, but when we came to the substance use section, we think about alcohol and other drugs in a way. So it could be alcohol, we think about smoking, we think about cannabis, other illicit substances. And on the other side, we also think about any medications prescribed. Now, as we go lower down, of course, in this case, there was no psychosis, no bipolarity. There was no evidence of affective symptoms such as you know depression and trauma, anxiety, eating disorder, OCD were also ruled out. So this was not vomiting as part of an eating disorder. And finally, there were no real significant abnormalities in personality structure either. So really what we're left with is that substance use section uh, where there was evidence of cannabis use. So we went into further detail of cannabis um, use and uh, she was a regular uh, and quite a heavy user of cannabis. So having ruled out everything, we came up with the hypothesis that this is most likely a cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And the treatment was cessation of cannabis, uh, which actually made the syndrome better. And what was the additional clue that told us this is very, very likely cannabis hyperemesis syndrome is frequent hot showers to relieve the hyperemesis. Now, this is a very curious clue and a curious sign that occurs as part of the cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. So let me take you through this interesting um, sort of diagnosis and interesting phenomenon or syndrome that occurs in individuals with heavy cannabis use over an extended period of time and often can be uh, sort of confusing when they present to emergency departments for repeated vomiting. So cannabis hyperemesis syndrome is basically consists of chronic cannabis use episodes of nausea and vomiting, and frequent hot bathing or hot showers. Now, it's paradoxical because cannabis does have anti-emetic effects, uh, anti-vomiting effects. It's prescribed in, in many cases in, um, in cancer treatments uh, to prevent that nausea associated with ke uh, chemotherapy. Uh, now, we know that uh, cannabinoids, you know, the cannabis plant contains more than 500 different molecules. And we know that certain molecules, for example, tetrahydrocannabinol, cannabidiol, and cannabigerol uh, are three cannabinoids that have a 
opposing effect on the emesis response. Now, when we think about cannabinoid uh, receptors or cannabis receptors, we've got CB1 and CB2. CB1 is a receptor that's predominantly in the central nervous system, while CB2 plays a, in the periphery and plays a very important role in the immune system. Now, the gastrointestinal effects, because cannabis hemp emesis syndrome is really about the gastrointestinal system, uh, this is mediated mainly by the CB1 receptors. And activation of CB1 receptors is postulated to delay gastric emptying. It can also result in lower esophageal sphincter relaxation and uh, associated with visceral pain and inflammation. And there is evidence that chronic cannabis use can be associated with gast gastritis and esophagitis, which contribute to the syndrome as well. Cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, let's look at it in a bit more detail. It consists of three main phases. There is a prodromal phase, two, there is the hyperemetic phase, and the third phase is the recovery phase. So in the phase one, what happens is the prodromal phase. This can be for months or years, with uh, patients often complaining of early morning nausea, a fear of vomiting, and abdominal discomfort. The phase two, which is the hyperemetic phase, is characterized by real episodes of intense and persistent nausea and vomiting. And this is when this 18 year old female patient presented uh, to us. And it's de um, described as really um, overwhelming and incapacitating, very, very distressing. And patients vomit, vomit uh, profusely, often without uh, warning. And um, can, you know, the retching can occur really five, six, seven times uh, an hour. So extremely uh, distressing and painful as well. And the relief is obtained really through this curious phenomenon of taking hot showers. And the mechanism is not completely known, but hot showers seems to adjust the thermoregulatory aspects that cannabis disturbs in the hypothalamus. Um, so apparently what cannabis does is it, it can increase core body temperature but on the uh, extremities, it can kind of reduce, it takes the sort of blood supply away from um, the peripheries. Now, the hyperemetic phase usually ceases within about 48 hours and treatment, um, often very important to provide supportive treatment with fluids, for example, some anti-emetic medications as well. And that hot bathing or hot showers becomes a learned phenomenon. So this is something that we ask in history taking to add to the hypothesis, this is cannabis hyperemesis uh, syndrome. And finally, the third phase is recovery phase. Now, this is often associated with, um, you know, the need to cease cannabis. Now, sometimes what happens is patients uh, will continue using cannabis because when they're vomiting, there is the belief that cannabis actually has an anti-emetic effect, anti-vomiting effect. So they continue to increase their use, which can make the situation worse. So recovery is often um, associated uh, or, or comes about when cannabis is use is ceased. So in terms of treatment, of course, firstly, fluids, very, very important, um, uh, you know, providing fluids if, if someone's vomiting, electrolytes as well. Now, one can try things like 5-HT3 uh, antagonists such as Ondansetron, a D2 receptor antagonists, uh, metoclopramide sometimes, or domperidone, these are provided to uh, treat the uh, vomiting. We have um, histamine receptor antagonists as well. And uh, really, the definitive treatment is, of course, cessation of a cannabis. Uh, I mentioned uh, the most effective treatment is really ends up being hot showers. I hope that this sort of gives you an idea about the uh, a curious side effect or effect of cannabis, um, which is cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. I look forward to seeing you in another edition of Hub Bites. Take care and stay safe. Bye bye.